It's fast, it's reasonably fast. Um, that's a, I can do that any day of the week. Probably. And it's not escaping by much at all. Again, this is a small radius movement because we're almost exactly in line with the forearm's axis of rotation. And uh, wrist flexion, extension, they're all like intersecting at that point. So the thing is just really rotating in space along a tiny semicircle, right? Um, what kind of, uh, what can we do? So. It, I'm showing you the movement here. I didn't actually practice this as a isolated movement on a single note on a string. I can do this now because I've isolated the feeling of the movement and I can actually make the movement. But I can only do this because I can do the movement. What I actually did to practice this instead was really um, to take some basic fretboard shapes where I could try to re quote unquote request that motion path along this way and kind of smooth it out over time is kind of what I did. And of course, the, a classic uh, one note per string type of shape that you might want to practice is this one. We can do it in F, the C major shape. We're going to do it up here in F. And uh, when I first met Martin Miller, he, was, he did all this great cross-picking stuff using this shape, and I had already been kind of tooling around with this shape as well. I think one of the reasons it's, it's nice for this type of practice is because the fretboard stretch is not large. So you can just do one note per string very easily with only a four fret stretch. That. You can hit that from the side and you can see what it looks like. Now I'm, I'm doing that quickly so you can sort of see what the shape of it is supposed to look like. But if I slow that down a little bit, I would try to practice this by, again, requesting the movement or requesting the, the, the motion path at a medium speed, not like that's going to feel super awkward and not very natural. Instead, you want to be really loose and try to have the pick escape on the down and on the up. Now I'm, in this particular case, I'm using less force. Why? Because if you use tons of arm pressure, you know, if you use tons of muscular force and put a lot of pick on the string and you have to apply a lot of force to get the pick through the string, and it can feel a little bit unnatural. And learning these complicated compound movements, or really any picking movement, is about learning what it feels like when you do something effortlessly. You're looking for that click where you're like, oh, I did it and I got it. And you can get that more easily when, you don't, when you're not distorting your view of what a thing feels like by applying so much force. So it's not an economy thing, really. It's not like using the smallest amount of pick. It's more like making the movement as naturally as you can make it, like trying to throw a ball as naturally as you can without trying to throw it as hard as you can, which can sometimes distort the force, the form, because you're, you're focusing more on power and not on the gracefulness of it. So what we want to focus on is the gracefulness. And again, I'm just doing this top to bottom across five strings, which I find to be a pretty comfortable uh, reach. When you really start to smooth this out, if you get the click and you can smooth it out, you will notice there's really very little going on in the arm uh, department. If you look at this from the side again, there's really not a lot of this turning happening. Remember that the extension movement is taking some of that, and so is the flexion movement, right? So if I exaggerated only the flex tension part of it, I would get this, right, just like that. Um, but I'm helping it out with a little arm. So it's, it's like a little help for my friends. Now, how do you practice this kind of stuff? That's generally how I do it. I'm looking for smoothness. I'm looking to feel it click. I want to see visually um, that it is symmetrical. I don't want to see this, this sweepy thing happening. A mirror is great for that. I like mirror practice almost even more than I like uh, in fact, I would use a practice mirror for this more than I would look down at my hand. Why? Because it keeps you focused on the feel. You're not micromanaging what it looks like, except that way, and, but you're not staring down at your hand 
and I think it helps you get in tune with the naturalness of it. All right, here's cool. So <laughs> you can do the triplet pattern. Just tooling around with this, it sort of doesn't matter what you do. I like a high degree of trial and error when I'm learning a uh, when I'm learning a new movement. I like a high degree of trial and error, a high degree of speed randomness. I don't like super slow speeds. I do like medium and fast speeds, and me I, I wouldn't go slower than medium slow. I would not do that at all because you are searching for that feeling of naturalness. And I would do this in short bursts. I would do this for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, stop, go away, go just like go you play video games or something that's completely not guitar. Come back and see if it's any different. Make small adjustments in your hand position and your pick position and your grip. Change your grip, use different picks. Anything you can do to shuffle that deck to produce, even if it's only randomly, a moment or two where you're like, oh, ooh, ooh, I think that's it. Oh yeah, 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 what was that? And guarantee you won't get it back. You'll do it once and you'll be like, damn it, where did it go? And you can't do it. Put the, put the guitar down, it's done. You're done. For, come back 10 minutes later, try it again. Seriously, there is an art to trial and error. And especially when you're doing these kinds of movements that are more like natural, real world movements, like throwing a ball, using all these joints, trying to generate these motion paths. It is very much an, a, a trial and error art form. One of the things I loved about Andy Wood when we interviewed him is he totally talks about this. He's like, you know, basically you can't keep doing the same thing if it's not working. He's like, mix it up, do something. He also said, floor it. That's the, you know, the, I think it was a Sean Lane quote perhaps where you, you just go really fast and see what happens. A lot of times if you do this super fast, even if it's still in the sloppy phase, you might hit upon a thing where you're like, yeah, I missed half of those notes, but it felt really fast and effortless. You know, if you're just like you're hitting open strings, right? Okay. Yeah, but if you look at that in a mirror or if you film yourself and you watch it back, is the hand kind of doing the movement? If so, that's actually good. Amazingly, you can be kind of wrong on the notes, but really very much closer to right on the movements when you're trying to do this motion mechanic type of learning, this motor learning stuff. Getting the notes 100% right is not the priority. Getting the movement to be sort of realistic, be smooth-ish, realistic-ish, and look kind of like... Um, what it looks like when, you know, when it's later on in the phase, in the development phase. That's what you're shooting for. It can be sloppy. I wouldn't try to, to play all the strings. Why? Well, remember, that's a different movement, right? If you actually tried to do this, right, hitting multiple strings, that's a different picking motion. You actually do want to try to hit only one note at a time or whatever. You want to try and hit the note that you're targeting. Um, because you're, that's the way this movement works when you get it. It is a movement that can target one note at a time without hitting other notes or the surrounding strings. But it's okay if you screw it up and you hit something in the prop. What we're talking about here is motor learning, mechanical learning. Um, and, and it really is, is much more exploratory process than I think traditional music pedagogy has led us to believe. It is not starting slower and getting faster, or playing all the notes exactly correctly. You can't do that if you don't have a movement or even know how that movement is supposed to work. The only way you can do that is if you, it, it's kind of the chicken and egg thing. How can you do a movement correctly if you've never done it correctly before? And especially, this goes triple if you're self-teaching. Like, you know, it's uncharted territory. You don't have anybody who can say, hey, put your hand here and do this. So you have to generate all those random possibilities yourself and you have to be super in tune and aware of when those random possibilities end up actually being correct. Mm -hmm.